Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Unapologetically Woman. We're celebrating phenomenal women all across Kentucky who make no apologies for their perspectives or the impacts that they're making in the community. Today, we're celebrating Shayla Lynch, who unapologetically and selflessly leads from the heart. Shayla is the Executive Director for Ampersand Sexual Violence Resource Center and is a civil rights advocate. Unapologetically woman, Shayla, that's you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So honored to be here. Oh, I'm so happy to be able to be in the same space and celebrate you. <laughs> but I'm going to start off with a quote that someone said about you uh -oh. and just to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Shayla is out here killing it with grace, dignity, fierceness, and intelligence. What does it feel like when somebody says those kinds of things about you? Oh, wow. I'm humbled first, and then secondly, are they? Are you sure you're talking about me? Yeah, <laughs> I'm talking about you. Talking about you. Oh, uh, because it doesn't, normally, day to day, I don't feel that way. I just feel like I'm doing what God has called me to do. You know, just doing what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. So, um, it's awesome to be recognized, and I feel humbled that someone actually said those words about me. Wow. <laughs> that, it is wow. great. Okay, yeah. so I felt like today, before I knew I was meeting with you, I'm like, I feel like I need to be exercising or something, because <laughs> talk to us about Shape It Up with Shayla. Yes, that is my passion career. I love health and fitness, um, and I fell into it, I kind of, I feel like accidentally. Um, I'm a trained dancer, tap, ballet, jazz, and modern since I was two years old, and so I've danced my whole life, and so... Um, I, when I got finished with law school, I was like, what am I going to do now? I'm not dancing. I don't have time to dance. What am I going to do? And so I found fitness. I've always been kind of a gym rat. And so I kind of, uh, when Zumba became popular, I, I found, found that Zumba was the perfect marriage of dance and fitness. So mm -hmm. that was one of the first certifications that I got. And it just kind of took off from there. And it is my passion career um, wholeheartedly. I love teaching. And I've since become a personal trainer. And I love training folks, helping them attain their health and fitness goals. So I love it. I mean, I would do it for free. I've done it for free before just because I love working with people in that way and helping them attain their goals. So I get up at 5 a.m. most days of the week to train clients, go to work. Then after after ampersand, I go and train two or three or more clients in the evening. Might not get home to 10. But um, I'm tired, but I love every day. I love every minute of it. You do more before I get up out of the bed in the morning. <laughs> You do. You know, you, look, you're on your third win, and I'm just getting out of the bed in the morning. Oh, my gosh. So tell me, what do you do at Aberstan, executive director there? I have the awesome um, ability and um, blessing to lead a team of dynamic um, staff members that fight sexual violence in our region. We serve 17 counties, and we um, help survivors who have been um, who have experienced sexual violence. We also help their families and their friends and their kids, if necessary, by providing wraparound services such as crisis counseling and therapy. We also do prevention works. So we go into the schools in our 17 counties to teach kids what consent is and let them know what a healthy relationship looks like, and then how to intervene should they suspect that their friends are in an abusive relationship. Um, we do lots of education and outreach, and then we have a very robust volunteer program. Um, we love our volunteers. We could not make it without our volunteers, and they help us staff our support line because we offer 24-hour, 365 support line that anyone can call if they feel the need to talk, if they've experienced sexual violence, if they want someone to meet them at the emergency room because uh, they've experienced an incident that night or that morning. So we're, we're dispatching volunteers and staff to our emergency rooms around our 17 counties to be advocates and supporters for survivors of sexual violence in that moment. Um, and then if they decide to pursue a case against the person who harmed them, we'll be with them during the legal process as well as their advocate and support system. So this, this is a tough field, Shayla. How did you mm -hmm. get into it? What brought you to this field, to this work? Um, I guess I would have to say, um, the, my, when I started with the Lexington Fair Housing Council, um, that's kind of where I honed my skills as an advocate and hone my skills as being a direct service servant, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I love direct service. I love advocating for other individuals. I love helping them meet their needs and um, be in their voice when they feel like they're voiceless. So Shayla, what about African American women? What kind of incidences of sexual violence have, you know, are out there, or what are the numbers? Um, African American women are um, seeing, uh, being involved in sexual violence, being survivors of sexual violence, extremely high rates. We're pretty much at a crisis level right now. 
Um, so much so that um, since I've been at Ampersand, we've made sure to take some strides to really reach out to the African American community in our region to make sure that they are aware of our services and that we're there to meet their needs um, wherever they are. Um, we um, launched just last year a special um, retreat for African American females or female identifying survivors. That was a huge success and we're going to have that again. Um, because the need is there and the incidence rate is extremely high. It's extremely high. So we're trying to definitely meet those needs here um, in, in the bluegrass region as best, we can, as best as we can. So when you when you compare what's happening with black women to other women, why do you think that is? Do you think that reporting has a lot to do with this or no? I think that the, the unreported numbers are very high. People are not reporting. They don't feel comfortable reporting. And I think um, it could be in part to a cultural thing, you know, a cultural shame. Um, we don't, sometimes some of us grow up saying keeping our family secrets in our families and we don't, we don't report. What happens in this house yeah. stays in this right. house. Right, and uncle so-and-so -so touched me and I know it happened and I told mama and mama said to keep it to myself. And we perpetuate that legacy of harm and trauma and that's not okay, it's not good. And so um, trying to break that traumatic cycle is huge and we have to continue to do that and speak speak to this, the, um, all African-American women and um, anyone who feels like they've, they've been a survivor or survivor of sexual violence, that it's okay to speak up and that you will be supported in that speaking up. So you're seeing people when they are having the toughest times mm -hmm. in, in their lives. How do you encourage them? We try to be um, survivor-focused and survivor-centered at Ampersand. So we don't come in preaching and teaching. We come in saying, what do you need? How can we help you in this moment? And if it's just being there in the room in the hospital with them just sitting if it's having a conversation with them if it's just providing them with the materials and, so and they want to be by themselves is doing that we're just we're there to meet whatever their needs are in that moment is and then letting them know that we can provide continued services for free so that if they should like to choose that avenue so we try to be always be survivor centered in our work okay and so because, look, I'm always worried about somebody's mental health when, when you're mm -hmm. working in a tough field. How do you protect that mental, your mental health and make sure that you're still well, um, even in spite of the difficult challenges mm -hmm. that you see every day with women? It's a challenge. Um, I'm not going to make light of it. It's really a challenge. Um, I'm a big proponent of self-care, and I've tried to um, have that thread throughout my staff and my team that self-care is important. If you need to take a day off, take a day off, no questions asked. Um, we have a vicarious trauma task force at our agency mm -hmm. that is um, specific about looking at vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, and hit, looking at it head on so that we can try to prevent that burnout that can happen when you're dealing in, with trauma work like we do every day. Um, and it's being creative, especially during this um, pandemic, we had to be creative since we couldn't physically be together. We've done a lot of um, things from like everything from having a cooking class, virtual cooking class, to days off of work, to um, just encouraging all kinds of self-care, virtual yoga class for all the staff and team. We just try to be intentional about it because the, the trauma can take its toll on you, definitely. Oh, absolutely. So if there's a young girl or a woman watching who's experiencing any of this, and what, what would she need to do? Um, if she feels um, ready, able, and willing, and capable, she can call our support line. It is 859-253-2511, and someone will answer it day or night, um, and they will, um, all they will do is listen, and we will not preach, but listen to whatever um, you would like to share, and if you will want help, we'll definitely um, connect you with that help. Okay. You've got a superhero in your life. <laughs> Tell me about your dad. <laughs> I love my dad. I know. I'm I, such a daddy's girl. <laughs> I know. I said, oh, she calls him superhero. Yeah. Tell me about him. He's, he's got my, some exciting news. Yeah, he's my super dad. And when I was a kid, when he would take one step, I would take two right behind him. I, I, I've always been a daddy's girl. Um, but he has recently been elected as the first African-American mayor in Hopkinsville, my hometown. Uh -huh. That's exciting. And it's very exciting. And it's just been awesome to celebrate that victory, the win for the community. Um, and just to watch him as he takes that role and just does some awesome things. He's definitely my role model. Um, both he and my mom are some phenomenal leaders um, and civic leaders in my community in Hopkinsville. And so um, they are both my role models and my superheroes. So how do they influence you? What do, how do they influence, influence you and affect the work that you do? Do you look up to them and say, that's who I want to be, that's what I want to do? What do you think? Definitely. From like a very young age, my parents had my younger brother and I 
out in the community working with them. It wasn't like a them dragging us along. They're like, no, you're going to come and work with us. And whether it was doing a ha building a habitat home or giving out food to the soup kitchen, they had us involved in the community from a very young age. So it's kind of like already built into my DNA. It's automatic. Like I, uh, when I moved to Lexington, I was like, okay, where can I go volunteer? This is like an immediate in my DNA that I, I want to be giving back in some way because God has blessed me with so much. So um, just they encourage us to always be active and engaged in the community because that's what they did um, every single day. And we watched them and you always want to, you want to be what you see. And so we've always been very, very um, community service oriented and it's just a part of who I am and I love it. That's probably the part of my life where I get so much energy and, and is giving back to others. Because I know that you're also a part of Delta Sigma Theta, mm -hmm. you know, which is all about public service and improving mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. And how does that, you know, it looks like you've just got that trail from birth on, mm -hmm. you know, to be a, a part of public service. Yeah, Delta um, is a great fit for me and my lifestyle because community service plays um, such a big part in my life. Um, I love to serve others and to meet needs. And as I said uh, before, being a voice for the voiceless. Um, and, and being that connection in that gap. So it's just a natural fit, definitely a natural fit. But that's not all you do. Okay, come on. <laughs> Junior Achievement of the Bluegrass. Talk yes. about what you do there. Let's let's show off a little bit today, Shayla. <laughs> I love working with the babies. I don't have any babies, so I love working with the babies. And so it's so much fun to go into a kindergarten class and they're like, oh, hey, Miss Shayla, to come give you hugs. And they are so mm -hmm. eager and excited to learn about whatever entrepreneurship lesson we're going to have that day. So I've been volunteering with them for over 10 years, and I, I love that interaction. I love working with youth. It's one of my, another one of my passions, and like junior achievement is a perfect fit because you can, I go in there and teach them about things they're going to really actually use when they grow up. Um, um, learning about economics and entrepreneurship is so important, and to learn that at a young age, because I didn't have junior achievement when I was a kid. So I think it's right. very great, a great program. I'm glad to volunteer and go into the classrooms and also serve on their program advisory board too. And you also volunteered William Wells Brown. You're a mentor there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was able to, um, through a program with Alpha Phi Alpha, to go in and uh, with their Reading, Writing, Rewards program to go into mentor and tutor youth there. And I, again, I love it. And it was great because once I was assigned a student, I had the same student the entire year. So you really get to form a bond with that student. And it's more than just you know, re revising their writing or helping them read books. You really form a relationship and you, you can make, make a really big impact. But that's not all you do either. <laughs> You're at No Lie. What are you doing over there? Well, I know <laughs> I'm not there anymore. Oh, but okay. I, I was on their board for, I think, three years and they were three fun yet challenging years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, since I've rolled off of the board, it's awesome to see how the organization has continued to flourish and impact the community. Um, like the Julieta Market, that's at Gray Line Station, um, that was just a pipe dream when I joined their board. We were just talking about what if we could have this, you know, indoor market in the community that would, you know, serve, you know, a lot of um, citizens of color and entrepreneurs. It was just a pipe dream then, you know, and I thought in my back of my mind, can, they, can we really pull this off? Well, it happened. We have Gray Line Station. Mm -hmm. It's so awesome to see like the fruits of our labor um, from those early days on the board. So, and and listen, most most times it just starts with a dream. Yeah, just having a, an idea about what it is that you want to do, and the next thing you know, you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, speaking of doing it, you spent last summer working on the mayor's commission for racial justice and equality right mm -hmm. here in Lexington. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to give up your summer <laughs> and do that hard work? And when I think back and reflect on my decision um, when I got the phone call, I didn't even hesitate. And I've been trying to make myself, before I say yes or no to folks that ask me to do things, I try to have a pause, a nice long pregnant pause, so I can really <laughs> think about, okay, Shelly, do you really have time to do this? But that didn't happen when I got that phone call. It was just an immediate, of course I'll do it, you know, um, because housing is my passion. Um, um, I didn't know that that's what, that's what I was going to fall in love with when I got out of law school. Um, but I loved doing fair, fair housing work. And I saw this as an awesome opportunity to make real impact in our city, to really unearth the ugliness mm -hmm. that exists here when it comes to housing and gentrification, to shed a spotlight on it. So once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so that means we have to do something about it. So um, it was long, hard work. Um, 
but I we had a phenomenal subcommittee and we had some really great discussions, some hard discussions, and I think that we were successfully um, able to pull together a report that shows a really good picture of what's going on in Fayette County um, and draw some really great um, solutions for the problem. And so the commission came came by way of um, the outcry for racial justice that happened, mm -hmm. you know, over the past year. Mm -hmm. And so what were you, were you thinking about that in, in the quest to, to be on the commission? Um, were you thinking about your family? What, what were you thinking about? I really thought about all of the clients that I'd helped over the 15 years, my 15 years of the Fair Housing Council because um, discrimination is real. It happens every day. I've experienced it on more of the occasions than I care to think about. And when it deal, when you face racism and discrimination in your housing, something that's so vital to you, the stability of you and your family, um, it can leave you in a hopeless place. And it reminded me of all of my clients that I'd helped over, year, over the years and um, the cases that I won, the cases that I lost. Um, and I wanted to be able to find a win for our citizens here in Fayette County, a much needed win. Because for years, people have been calling us about issues in housing and some, things, some ways we couldn't help and some ways we could. And so it's fine, crafting solutions to a huge, huge problem. It's a huge, huge problem. And at first seemed insurmountable, but I think that we were able to really come together as a team and examine and do some really good deep dives to find some really solutions that I think will work for our city. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed on that. I know. <laughs> okay, so tell me, um, I saw you sliding down a sand hill. <laughs> Where was that? And that looked like so much fun. Where was that? I love to travel. Mm -hmm. And my uh, two best friends and I, for my 40th birthday, went to Dubai for a week. And it was absolutely amazing. Everyone needs to go to Dubai at least once in their life. It's no, I've Best been thing no ever. Other, yes, it was awesome. Um, and so that day we took a ride on some camels, and then we went to this um, fair, and we were on the in the sand dunes, and they were like, now you can ride, you know, get on the thing and ride down the sand dune. And I was like, of course I'm gonna do this. I'm like, this is once in my time <laughs> thing, and, I, and it was so much fun. It was it was the hardest walk up the sand dune, up the hill. It was mm -hmm. very, very hard, but coming down was so much fun. Well, it looked like you guys had a great time. Yeah, it was, you guys. It was, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. Yes, I was. I was hating. I was jealous <laughs> for just a second. Next just year you gotta second. come. Next I year I will come. <laughs> I will come. Yeah, now that the world's opening back up. I'm, I'm already planning my next international trip. I'm ready to go. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that you're able to, to make it. That yes. nothing happens with this pandemic. Yes. I'm, I'm looking for better days ahead. Yes, definitely. So, Shayla, I'm going to thank you for joining us today and letting us celebrate you. This You have been great and awesome. I'm going to leave you with the last word. Anything mm -hmm. you want to tell maybe young girls or women? I would say that um, continue to persevere in spite of um, what teachers may tell you or even your parents may tell you or relatives may tell you, tell you, listen to that voice inside of you and you continue to push and persevere because it's definitely worth it um, in the end. When I was a kid, I was extremely shy. I never talked at all, at all. I never talked, didn't feel comfortable talking. Um, I was that kid in class that knew all the answers but was afraid to raise my hand and, and give them in class because I was nervous and very shy. Um, and my parents pushed me, it was uncomfortable, but um, I'm no longer that shy kid, even though she's, she's still in there. Um, but I was able to push through and persevere and find my voice. It took a while. Um, it took just going through different life experiences, and dance was on, uh, one of the things that helped to open me up and find my voice. Um, but continue to push and persevere, no matter what others may say, because in the end, it's gonna be all worth it. Continue to push and find your voice. You heard it from Shayla today. Continue to join us as we celebrate other phenomenal women all across Kentucky who are making outstanding strides in the community. We'll see you soon.